our first demonstration, I'm going to invite uh, Roz uh, Strickland to come up. Roz is one of the uh, co-conspirators um, in uh, the projects that Scott has uh, been referring to. Um, she has led um, our community and, in fact, uh, many demonstrations around the country uh, on how to use uh, the, the incredible ecosystem of the Cleveland Clinic for purposes of civic education and engagement. And uh, right now, uh, without much further ado, I just want to provide the context for this conversation. We're about to go live into the surgical suite uh, in the Cleveland Clinic. And although you, I, we think you're going to find it interesting, I'm a whole lot more interested in what the students think uh, here as well as at the Alpha House because we're trying to demonstrate what is, do, what is doable in that context. So, Roz Strickland. Thank you, Lev, for that kind introduction, and good morning to everyone. And I want to welcome our distinguished guests from Washington here today to see what we're doing. And I want to extend my um, deepest gratitude to Lev and Scott for um, corralling me on this journey, because it has been a beautiful journey. Five years ago, we um, at the Cleveland Clinic were re-evaluating our community uh, outreach and we were beginning to look at uh, what could we do that would have a lasting impact on this community and going back to the mission which is a three parts it's education uh, patient care and research education really stood out because recognizing that education is the key to our future and the young people that you see here today representing the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine and I'm going to say that they're representing all of the students around the nation and actually worldwide. They are the key to our future. They are the ones that are going to unlock the doors and uh, bring about those innovations. So we were looking at what could we do and how could we partner with the Cleveland schools and then on to the regional schools to take a look at how we prepare our young people. I don't think there's any secret that um, is not unique to Northeast Ohio, but the, one of the fastest growing uh, professions is the healthcare profession. Math and science um, are some of the foundations for going into any one of those professions. So we decided to take an innovative approach and look at how we could marry what we do inside the walls of Cleveland Clinic every single day and bring that into the classrooms and co collaboratively work with the education system to bring those real world experiences to life and uh, provide students and, op and teachers an opportunity to see how what they're learning and teaching in the classrooms is actually applied in our environment. This, um, so we're more on the applied learning and one of the first things we did was partner with uh, Scott and one community to actually connect fiber to all 105 school buildings. So that's the first application so that they could be able to see um, virtual surgery that's taking place only it's live and be able to talk to them in real time like you're gonna see this morning. There are six specific areas that we focus in, math, science, health and wellness, the arts and innovation. We've heard a lot of talk over the, over the last several years nationally and we just recently signed the health care reform, but there's also been a lot of talk about um, health and wellness and promoting better care and individuals monitoring their own health, taking charge for your health and looking at how we manage chronic illnesses better so that um, people are living longer, but they're living, they're having a better quality of life. That starts young. It starts with our young people. So how do, so we take a different look at health and wellness and bringing that into the classroom, but how they can um, take that and learn how to take better care of themselves. Our offices span K to 12. Um, and actually go into higher ed as we work with uh, Lev and Case Western Reserve. But what you're gonna see today is a live surgery. It is Dr. Mark Luciano, he is a neurosurgeon. And the type of surgery that he is performing is, a, um, is uh, for a person who has hydrocephalus. So without further ado, I'm going to connect to, hi Dr. Luciano. Hello. Welcome Can you to hear the, me? Welcome to the Gigabit Breakfast Club. 
Thanks. Welcome, welcome to room six, operating room six. This room is, uh, is equipped for minimally invasive neurosurgery. We're able to go into the brain with the endoscopes you'll see through a hole about the size of a dime. And uh, we wanted to welcome you here. We're all really here in the operating room to help a lady who came to us, a 60-year-old woman, who came to us with hydrocephalus, a collection of fluid in the brain, in these ventricles centrally in the brain. This collection of fluid made her uh, have an imbalance, problem walking, and also had some problems with, with uh, short-term memory. This is very typical for long-term collection of hydrocephalus over many years, perhaps even as from as a child. Here you see a motion picture which shows that at one point there's a constriction of flow of the cerebrospinal fluid where it's blocked. Our goal is to go in with an endoscope into the center part of the brain and make a hole at the bottom of the brain to allow this fluid to escape where it can be absorbed naturally. This helps treat the hydrocephalus 70 to 80% of the time and doesn't require any more surgery. So I'm gonna walk over here now to the, uh, to the operating table. You've timed things very well because we've actually just finished our approach. We've drilled a hole with a power drill, which uh, quite, quite nicely stops when the bone is, is completely uh, gone through. We've made an exposure on the top of the head on the right side towards the front. This patient is laying flat, slightly up, and will be entering through what we call the, the frontal region. I'd like to introduce the people that are helping me today. Dr. Rodolfo Key, my fellow, Dr. James Lewis, senior uh, neurosurgery resident, and, and Kelly here is uh, scrubbing in with us. Uh, I think we can uh, begin, we could begin by looking in, and I'll show you around, but I will say that we're gonna go right to the part that we need to do and open that passage, and I'll, I'll show you as I go uh, and try and direct you. Can I have a peel away sheath? Just so you know how we've entered here, we drill the hole through the bone, and then we have a, a probe that gently enters into the ventricular system. After the probe is in, we remove the center part, and we then have a clear passage through which we can put other instruments into the brain. And that's what you see already placed in here and stabilized to the drapes. So I'm gonna ask uh, Rodolfo to come here and we're gonna start by looking through the endoscope and seeing inside what we call the lateral ventricles of the brain. We have the uh, house lights off. We'll make sure we're well oriented here. All right, and we're ready to start the irrigation. Not yet though. So we're going in. As you can see, there's a, not, oh, that's the, there we go. See a little bit of water there distorting the picture, but we're gonna enter the, the passageway. So now we're in that passageway and we're gonna be going down. Turn the irrigation on, please. We have to wait, there we go. So we're in this glass tube going down into the brain. In the brain of all of us, there are fluid spaces called ventricles. We have four of them. We're entering the right lateral ventricle. Around us, although you can't see it right now, is the underside of what we call the cerebral cortex, does all of our thinking. At the bottom is the areas of the brain, the central areas of the brain we call the basal ganglia. Helps us with many things. It's a relay station for the whole cortex and also helps with fundamental things like, like movement. You're looking at some veins at the bottom of the ventricle, and you're seeing some red substance called choroid plexus. That's what actually makes the fluid that we are now swimming in. At the bottom of this ventricle is a hole that leads into the next passage. This passage is called the frame of a row and leads into the third ventricle. This third ventricle is in the central portion of the brain, and the bottom of it is actually at the bottom of the brain. This third ventricle is widely dilated in her case. It's larger than it should be. I'm gonna come out a little bit because we're gonna place another probe through the system in order to, for us to make our fenestration. Uh, so we switch? Okay. That's good. You're stabilized there? Yeah. All right, stay up there. May I have the balloon? The way we make our fenestration is with a, what we call a balloon catheter. This catheter, both allows us to 
poke the hole at the bottom and allow the fluid to escape, and also allows us to dilate the hole to allow the hole to stay open for a long time. You'll see the probe in a moment. All right, there we go. Okay, if you head down south a little bit, scope down. Okay, you should be heading towards the frame of Monroe. There we go. Head straight down towards it. Excellent. Keep going. Excellent. Okay. A little bit more towards 12 o'clock. All right. At the bottom of the third ventricle is a thin area. I'm touching that now, and it's a thin membrane. A little bit more to 3 o'clock. There, that's the place we want to be. And down a little bit. To our left and right is an area called the hypothalamus. This is involved with the most fundamental parts of our physiology, eating, control of our autonomic nervous system. Below you see uh, two areas called the mammillary bodies. They're involved with memory and emotional processing. And just below where I'm touching, this nodule I'm touching, is actually the basal artery, a little bit more towards 3 o'clock. Excellent. That area feeds major portions of the brain stem, important parts of the brain, and the back part of the cerebral cortex. With this probe, I'm now making a hole right near that basal artery, but away from it. And preparing to enlarge that hole. This procedure used to be done in years past through an open craniotomy in the early 1900s, and it was done only under extreme conditions because it was a big operation. Now, again, we do it through a size of a, of a, of a dime-sized hole. I'm expanding the balloon. You can almost see through the balloon like a lens. And I'm going to show you the area of the brain underneath afterwards. Again, the cerebral spinal fluid in this area is trapped because it can't go out its normal passageway, which is actually out of sight here. So instead, we're making an alternate path on the floor of this ventricle and allowing the fluid to escape underneath the brain. Underneath the brain, we expect it to be absorbed the way it normally should be absorbed. This balloon may pop, by the way, but that's okay if it does. Oh, the kids had a couple of questions. Yes. What percentage of people have hydrocephalus? Oh, that, that's a great question because that, that actually is, is a little bit more controversial and changing in the last years. In terms of pediatric hydrocephalus, it's one to two per thousand people. And those are people that are born with hydrocephalus. And it's often the pediatric neurosurgeon that knows the most about hydrocephalus. However, there's other forms of hydrocephalus that occur uh, throughout adult life and even in the elderly. Uh, no, stay where you are. And that may occur in as many as 5% of people elderly people who have dementia. So there may be hundreds of thousands. We're going to come straight out now, and I'll take the scope for a bit. This is a kind of hydrocephalus in which we know where the obstruction is. So I'm going to take it. And we can bypass it using the endoscope. We've been treating hydrocephalus, uh, well, in, a, in the modern way, since the 19, late 1950s and 60s, with something called a shunt. And that's a tube that we implant and it drains the fluid all under the skin into the abdomen. However, this method with the neuroendoscope allows us to let the fluid be absorbed outside the brain the way it normally should be without any implanted tube. Again, I'm looking here at the choroid plexus. This is the substance, this is the substance that makes the fluid. The brain does not know that it should stop making fluid if it's building up. So it can actually build up in the brain and choke off the actual brain itself. So we need to maintain that normal circulation. 
as I go down through this passageway, the upper rim of this hole is an area called the fornix. It is actually crucial in memory. So we have to be careful as we go through that that is not affected. You'll see at the top at, at uh, 12 o'clock a red hole, a red blush. That red blush is a, is a system of blood vessels that head do, heads down towards the pituitary gland. It is the major control system for our endocrine system throughout our body. So we have the endocrine system at the top. We have memory, emotional functioning at the bottom of our screen. And on each side of us, we have things like eating, autonomic system, and many other physiological functions. As you see, we've made the hole at the bottom of the third ventricle. And I think you can begin to appreciate that underneath there's some, some, some structures. Those structures are blood vessels. Dark I'm going to go down, as we routinely do, and show you the space in there. Why do I do this routinely? I want to make sure we've made a hole all the way through, and then we are looking at the space outside the brain. So I just want you to, to realize we've come in at the top of the brain. We've entered a fluid spaces, followed them down through to the bottom of the brain, and come out the bottom of the brain. We're now looking down towards the neck. The basilar artery is a blood vessel that's coming up, and here are branches of the basilar artery that feed various areas of, of the brain stem and the uh, cerebral cortex. Dr. Luciano. And you might notice, I think, on the screen, I hope you can see that there's a sort of a spider web look to this whole area. This is called the arachnoid membrane, arachnoid for spider. And you can see why we named it arachnoid membrane. Oh, here's a tiny little blood vessel. And there's a tiny little bleed right there. But that will stop on its own. It's inconsequential. But you get an idea here of the delicate structures. So here you see that we have a clear passage outside the brain. And the hole is, is certainly large enough. It's greater than 5 millimeters. Minor bleeding, that usually stops. Infundibular recess going towards the pituitary gland. We'll wait a few moments. Dr. Luciano. Yes. We have time for two questions. Can you briefly tell us what skills are needed to perform this type of surgery so that students in the audience, if they're looking to go into neurosurgery as a career, what they will need to do? And also, can you tell us uh, what did you do to prepare for this surgery? Sure. We, uh... We obviously have years of training which teaches us about the anatomy of the brain uh, and exactly where we are so in any situation we can navigate properly. We also spend years practicing making movements and, and uh, using tools within the brain in order to be able to manipulate with as little trauma as possible. The whole neurosurgery training program takes seven years beyond medical school. In this particular situation, uh, I see, I see uh, probably 25 patients in the clinic, and we have people that come in that have obstruction. We, ha we can verify with imaging where their obstruction is and, and bring them in for the surgery, uh, of course, after all the appropriate pre-ops. So it takes years, really, to get to this stage to make this look this simple. Uh, but we have found that we could do hundreds of these here uh, and have, uh, have, have it done under clear visualization like you see open up fluid passages and not require any surgeries. So here in a few minutes, we've done an operation which I hope is life-changing for this woman. She came in with imbalance and problems that were progressive, and this procedure has a 70-80% chance of making her better. But it took years of preparation to get this. I should also say it took development of these very specialized neuroendoscopes. These are supplied by, by Storch. There are several companies that have specialized in making very, very delicate endoscopes to allow us to look this well into the brain. Thank you very much. Let's give him a hand. You're welcome.